We're not coming to stand before the Lord to be determined if whether we're making it into heaven or not. The judgment seat is where believers are rewarded based on how faithfully they served Christ. Wow. And some of the things that we're going to be judged on are how we obeyed the Great Commission. As you go into the world, make disciples. We're going to be judged on uh, how victorious we were over sin, how we controlled our tongues, how we demonstrated Christ in the church, in our marriage, how we raised and taught our children and family, how we managed our household finances, how we obeyed or honored our parents, how we worked for or respected our employers. The list can go on. But it's not determining if whether you make it into heaven or not. This is now how did you live after you received so great a salvation. Wow, isn't that great? Read this scripture. For no one, very, very important. Let's take a closer look at the judgment seat of Christ so we can see what it will actually going to be like. It says, for, this is uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 through 15. This may be new to some of you. You may have never heard these kind of scriptures talked about and gone into in depth. Um, but it's very important. You may wonder why some uh, believers are so confident and just moving forth in missions and winning souls and taking on the world. You know why? Because a lot of them, they've already been taught this. So they're not living their life trying to stay saved and stay holy and see what the end's going to be. They're already like, I know what I'm here for. I know what God's already done in my life. And now I'm going on and fulfill the purpose for which he gave me. I'm moving on now so that I could fulfill that. God's got my back. My citizenship is not on the line every minute of every day. My relationship's not on the line every minute of every day. God's not going to cut me off. No. Here is what we're looking at. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. What's the foundation? Jesus Christ. And nobody can lay any other foundation except for that. Now, here's the key for the rest of our life. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work, what's their work? Their gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, what day? The day of judgment. And for the believer, it's the day that we stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. That's where all of our work, the work that's laid, that we build on, what are we building on? The foundation's already laid. I'm saved. Jesus Christ is the foundation. Now we spend the rest of our life building on that foundation, obeying God, fulfilling his purpose, doing what he's telling us to do, obeying his word as a, for me as personally, not as pastor first, obeying God as a husband, obeying God as a father, obeying God by fulfilling, demonstrating his life on my job. I'm building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Now I'm living my life building. And the foundation is Jesus. What we've all been taught, most of us have been taught, is that we're working trying to get saved, to get into heaven, or working trying to stay saved. But no, we're not working to try to stay saved or working trying to get to heaven. Now we're working building on the foundation that's already been laid. Don't just give you confidence. John just sighed. Thank you, Lord. Now I'm just building on the foundation. He is the rock, the foundation of my life. The only reason why I'm going to heaven is because of him. Just say that to yourself. The only reason why I'm going to heaven is because of him. So sometimes late at night when you have those pressing thoughts or when you're just going through the day and things happen, and I know it happens to all of us. You have these thoughts like, am I really going to go to heaven? Am I really going to make it in? I remember one, time, one thing that got me 
even as a little kid, they would teach us and say things like, uh, if you died right now and you went up to heaven and you were standing at the gates, what's the reason why they should let you in? When they're standing there, you're standing there right now. What's the reason for them to let you in? Because this is where you find out whether you're confident or not. And, if, and so I stood and I thought in that moment and said, because I gave my heart to Jesus. Because I gave my heart to Jesus. I surrendered my life to Jesus. That's the reason why you should let me in. My little imagination, I was desperate. Because I gave my heart to Jesus. Let me in. That's the reason why. But many people will stand up and say, because I went to church and I shook the preacher's hand and I gave thousands of dollars to charity and I didn't beat up as many people as I could have. And I and they have all kinds of works reasons. But you know what God is looking for? The foundation. And so you got a lot of people that are trying to build work. But they're not building on the fo the foundation hasn't been laid yet. The foundation is Jesus. So if you ever, ever start, stop and think sometimes, why should they let me in? Then it comes all the way down because I gave my heart to Jesus. That's it. That's the foundation. Now we're living our life just building on that. Now let's get back to the judgment that's now for us as believers. Their work or the believer's work, verse 13, will be shown for what it is because the day, the judgment day, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. There it is in scripture, y'all. God's going to test our work to see it so we can see it for what it is. Did we build on the foundation with wood? Because if we did, y'all know what happens to wood. Fire is going to test all of our work. It's like God's going to take everything that we ever did and pile it all up and set it on fire. Poof. And everything that's wood and hay and straw I did this for the Lord. I did it. Yeah. The only thing that's going to be left. Remember we used to sing that song, only what you do for Christ will last. Now I'll get more specific. Only what you do for Christ that he told you to do will last. Because a lot of people doing stuff for the Lord. And he ain't told you to do that. He ain't even in it. They're doing it in the name of the Lord. But they ain't even doing it for God. It's really for them. It's what I always wanted to do, what I always wanted to be. And that stuff will burn. Wow. Now look at the next profound scripture, verse 14. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. The reward is not heaven. Remember I talked about that? Because you're already going to heaven. What we're, what's now what's being judged what's being judged and determined is what your rewards are going to be for your life after you got saved verse 15 if it is burned up with what's burned up all the, the stuff that I did everything that I did after I got saved the builder will suffer loss look at the key phrase but yet Here's the scripture. That's why I didn't tell you. This ain't Pastor Chris just saying stuff. What does it say? But yet will be saved. That person, they, got, they, they made it in. And, here's the, and, the, and Paul said it, even though only as one escaping through the flames, it'll be as if though you, I barely got in. That's what it's going to feel like. But you can save. But your work's burned up. All that stuff you did, it burned up, unless you were building with gold and silver and precious stone. Wow. Remember when I talked about the different rewards? This is very important what I'm going through with you today. All of this is part of building that confidence in the successful seed that God has for us. Remember we talked about the various crowns, the imperishable crowns. If you don't remember that, we still got those DVDs from uh, 
December the 30th uh, on our New Year's Eve, on December 31st, I should say, on our New Year's Eve night in which we talked about the various crowns. Recall how we discussed the difference between a gift, the gift of salvation, and eternal life and heaven. And we talked about the difference between receiving the gift of the eternal life and the rewards and crowns that are earned for faithfulness. There is a difference. We are given eternal life. You repent, turn away from your own way, receive Jesus Christ. Receive what was done on the cross on our, in, on our behalf. And the foundation of Jesus is established in our life. From that point on, now we're building. And we're either building with wood, hay, and straw, or gold and silver and precious stones. And somehow I know in my life I've probably got a mixture of both. Got some wood and hay and straw, some stuff I thought that God wanted me to do and I was supposed to do, and some stuff was selfish and some stuff was ignorant. And then there are some other things that, yeah, is exactly what God told us to do. And it's the same for you. You're doing exactly what God told you to do. All the mothers in the room, I'm telling you, yeah, that's gold. So when you're looking at the children going, oh, Lord, is it worth it? <laughs> it's worth it. It's worth it. Um, remember, we talked about the crowns, the rewards for victory. There's a difference. In fact, there's a difference. There are the crowns and rewards for victory that God gives us. He gives, he's going to reward us for our victories, for our service, for our places of authority. He is. That's why I'm saying that to the moms and dads. That's places of authority. There's reward coming for that. Raising up a godly heritage. Raising up your children to know the Lord. God's looking at everything. Everything. So now you can see, boy, there's some really, there, there's a whole lot, lot that God's really looking at and uh, that he plans to lavish us with rewards concerning. He really does. But then the crown, all of the crowns that indicate royalty or dignity and eternal life, here's the precious part. These crowns were gained for us by Jesus. Because we couldn't pay for eternal life. Ain't nothing we can do to earn it. Not by works of righteousness. For by grace we've been saved through faith. It's the gift of God, the Bible says, not of works. So we don't earn that. Jesus earned that one for us. So you know you've heard the songs, I shall wear a crown of gold. I shall wear a crown. <laughs> when the trumpet sounds, that's old school. When the trumpet sounds, yeah. I shall wear a crown. Yeah, those of you that know about that, we, I'm not putting it down, but in many ways, they got the two different things mixed up. Some of our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and they thought that all of this working that we're doing is to get the crown of making it into heaven. But Paul and Peter, the apostles, they picked up on this. That there are crowns that we earn in heaven. But the one crown to make it into heaven, we couldn't earn that. Jesus earned that one for us. Wow, it's like being on death row, and we were. Can you imagine being on death row? And the day of your execution, someone shows up and says, I'll take their place. Whew. Oh, that touches me deep in my heart every time I say that. I'll take their place. And they let you and me walk out. Walk out free. And they die in our place. That's what Jesus did. Wow. Can you take a moment and say thank you, Lord, right now? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And that's also why I keep trying to emphasize over and over again, God's not so quick to be booting folks out and kicking them out. Why would he go to all of these lengths to come to earth, live here for 33 years, and suffer the way he did? All of that so that we could have this relationship with his father 
and yet we teach it as if though every single moment God's looking for a reason to cut us off. My God. If he's looking for a reason to cut us off, then we, why did he even bother to come? He could have just cut us off. He's looking for every, and he did. He looked for and found every single way possible to get us, and he did it. His son. And now the foundation has been laid when we receive his son. And now he just tells us, now just obey me. Obey. Live the life. Serve. Walk in the authority, the places of authority that I've given you. Because I'm going to reward that. When you're standing before me, here's Christ. When you're standing before me in all the universe, and we're looking at how you built upon the foundation, I want to be able to reward you as a wife, as a mother, as a, as a husband, as a father, as a friend, on your job, the various jobs and occupations that you held in this life, and how you served me, how you served your employers, how you ministered to your friends and family around you, how you decided, okay, if nobody else is going to be encouraging in this family, I'll be encouraging. If nobody else is going to forgive, then okay, I'll go ahead and forgive. God looks at that. Thank you, Lord. He said, that's gold to me. That's gold. That's precious stones to me. See, now you're building on the foundation that I laid for you. That's precious to me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And even when you have those seasons and times in your life, when you're just not feeling it, and things go wrong and you get discouraged and you have unfruitful times, I don't go, well, you cut off. I go, oh, it's time for me to move you. <laughs> Just time for me to make some adjustments. Because I know what I put in you. Remember going back to the parable of the seed sown into the field, the wheat, and even though there's tares all around you, oh, no, I'm not worried about you. I'm not going to even try to move all the weeds out from around you. Let it all grow up together because judgment day is coming. And all the stuff that's fake and phony and all of that, oh, my sons are going to shine forth. You may look foolish right now. We live in a day and a time. I keep looking at all the moms in the room. We live in a day and a time where motherhood is put down. But even though we live in an era in this world where motherhood is put down, and isn't seen as anything really all that important, uh, God looks at the sacrifice that you made, and he's saying, that's gold, that's precious stone, that's silver. And one day I will openly reward and show, oh, this is what I thought about you as a mom. Dads that are doing what you're supposed to do. Every dad in the room, and I'm one of them, you're just making the sacrifice. The family's coming first. I'm going to do whatever it takes. God looks at it and says, see, that's, you acting like my daddy. Can you imagine Christ saying that to you? Good job. You represented my daddy well. That's gold to me. Even though you lived at a time in the world where fatherhood, the only thing they could talk about was the abusive fathers, the neglectful fathers, the deadbeat dads, but you represented me. You represented me, and that's gold to me. Thank you, Lord. Doesn't it make it precious today? Thank you, Lord. So these are some of the, these are with the crowns that are listed. Um, the crown of life in James 1 through 12, the crown of glory, the crown of righteousness, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of rulership. These are very specific. Uh, the crown of life is given for those who endure against temptation. Uh, also with their faithfulness. The crown of glory is given to faithful pastors and elders. The crown of righteousness is available for all of those who live righteously and righteous acts. So you say, why, why, why live right? You know, since, since I've got the foundation and I'm going on to heaven, then why live right? Well, number one, because we're representing the Lord our God. And you also, you don't ever want to start playing that game. Let's see how close I can live uh, in, in to the world and be like the world. Because uh, you don't want to start down that path. You don't, want, you don't even want to start down that path. 
of being carnal. Carnal just means being fleshly ruled, being led by your flesh. About that in Romans. Since I know that grace is abound, should I just take advantage of it? Because, you know, the more you mess up, the more grace going to be there. No, I said, God forbid. Here's another one that will always keep you in check. You reap what you sow. In this life, you will reap it. If you sow to the flesh, the Bible says, you will of the flesh reap corruption. I watch this in my life. I watch this even in, I'll tell you this brief story. My, one of my brothers, he died 10 years ago, uh, 11 years ago now. Um, man of God, we all grew up in the same household. We used to travel around the country as a family, ministering all over the country, uh, preaching, singing, music. Laying hands, everything. He reached a point in his life, he got frustrated, mad, because uh, he got lied on by a preacher in a church. He got hurt. He walked away from the things of God, spent a long time in the world. He ended up contracting uh, HIV, became full-blown AIDS. Uh, and even though he came back to the things of God, and we rejoiced at his funeral, but he left here early. Here's what I'm getting at. You reap what you sow. So even though when he died, he went to heaven, first of all, he left here early. See, that's, the thing. that's why I say these things about being confident, uh, uh, being watchful of, of believers saying, well, let's just see how close I can get to the world. Well, no, uh, you will reap. He sold to his flesh, and of the flesh he reaped corruption. God didn't deliver him of AIDS. We even prayed and asked the Lord, Lord, please heal him, please heal him. And the only thing the Lord will respond to was, was his word. This is for believers. This is for believers. And I'm not saying that this was the judgment that he reaped in his flesh. He sold to the flesh, and of the flesh he reaped corruption. Why was it so severe in his life? Probably because he was, he was not a novice. This was not somebody who just been saved five years or so and then got disappointed and went away. Because I've heard of people who had been saved that long, went and did the same thing, and came back and didn't contract nothing. Didn't nothing happen to them. Wow, there was a baby in the Lord. They wouldn't know. This was a pastor. My brother's a pastor, elder, minister, like me. Big difference between Pastor Chris decided that I'm going to go I'm, I'm tired of being married to Carol and let me have some fun and do what I want to do for a little while here in Harrisburg. There's a big difference between Chris Green doing that as a pastor, been saved for over 40 years and been in ministry for over 25 years. Big difference between somebody like me doing that and somebody who may have been saved five, six years doing that. To whom much is given, much is required. So somebody that sins and messes up, uh, that didn't know any better, they get a few stripes. But when you know, and I'm one of those people, and you know, oh, there's going to be a lot of stripes. Sometimes even when we discipline our kids, first thing out of our mouth is, you know you know better. <laughs> even we as parents have degrees of the punishment because you know there are times that you may be about to discipline your child and then you have realized, Oh, I never really told you about that. So I can't punish you for something that I didn't tell you. You didn't even know. But when I've told you, and you know, and we've talked about this, and I've even punished you about this before, and I forgave you over and over and over and over and over again. See, people like to play on the grace of God like that because God is so forgiving, and he's so merciful, and he keeps forgiving over and over and over again until one day somebody steps across the line and he says, oh, okay, now i got to let you deal with the consequences. Not you going to hell, but in your flesh you are going to reap the consequences. I hope this is helpful for you today. Thank you, Lord God. I'll close with this one. Next week, we're going to talk about these different judgments. We'll get into this a little bit more next week. We're going to talk about the judgment of nations, the judgment of the believers, and the judgment of unbelievers. It's going to be very important. Don't miss this, because we're talking about the confidence that you should have, so you don't ever be afraid. This is one of those messages that changed, these teachings that changed my life when I discovered that at the end of it all, 
God is not going to be judging believers the same way he judges unbelievers. It's not the same. Unbelievers, they're going to be judged based upon their works, but you know why their works will cause them to go into eternal punishment? Because they didn't have the foundation of Jesus. So the only thing God can judge them by is their works. Because they didn't have the blood to cover their sin. Aren't you so glad that your tape going to be erased? It's like playing a DVD. Here is your life. And everybody's tape that ain't been erased by the blood, there it all is. But for those of us that have been covered, somebody say covered. Thank you, Lord, for covering. <laughs> and parts of my tape are erased. Why? Because the blood. Thank you, Lord. That's just your kind of your appetizer. But I want you to say these phrases to me, with me today as we close today. Very, very important. Let's all say this today together. God is committed to me. Come on, let's say it again. God is committed to me. Next one. God's not looking for reasons to curse me. Isn't that good to know? God's not looking for reasons to cut me off. <laughs> God will never leave me or forsake me. I want you to remember this this week. God unconditionally loves me. God is not withholding himself from me. Thank you, Lord God. God is not mad at me. You ever wonder why you keep hearing Israel Holden keep singing these songs over and over again about God's not mad at me? Because he, like a lot of us, grew up in churches where that's just how you end up feeling. Like God is constantly mad. Do you occur to you, anybody ever think God laughs? Do you know that God has flex to have fun? When I became a father, that's when I discovered that God really does like having fun. Because as much as I love playing with my sons, we were, then it occurred to me, God's a father. And just like I come, like, come running home and running around the house and wrestling and playing with my sons, God likes having fun with his kids. Say that again. God is not mad at me. Thank you, Lord. God is not disappointed with me. Come on, put, put your hand over your heart and say that. God is not disappointed with me. Sometimes we're disappointed with ourselves, but I want you to understand, God is not disappointed with me. Next one, God is not frustrated with me. How many times have you heard the sermons, God is tired. Those saints that God is tired. No, the preacher's tired. <laughs> No, the pastor is tired. <laughs> pastor is tired of preaching the same message over and over again. But God don't get tired of repeating himself. God doesn't get tired. Well, here you are again. Same old prayer requests. Here you are again. You promised a hundred times you wasn't going to stop doing this. And here you are again. God is not frustrated with me. Say this one. God is not offended by me. Very important. God's not offended by me. There ain't nothing that you have done or doing or will do that will offend God. Thank you, Lord. Here's the next one. Say it together. God is not ashamed to call me his own. Thank you, Lord. God is my daddy, and he loves me. Last two. Knowing that God loves me like this gives me the desire and power to be committed to him. That's what does it. It's knowing that he loves me. 
We say it all the time. I love him because he first loved me. So I'm committed to him. Why? Because he first committed to me. Thank you, Lord. And the final one, knowing that God loves me like this gives me the desire and power to be committed to my family. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, I thank you for this time that you've given us together today just to share and to speak these things, to build your people, to build your people up, to be confident in you. Thank you, Lord God, for your commitment to us. Thank you, Lord God, for your confidence that we will still be a successful seed even with all the weeds that are grown and been sown around us. Thank you, Lord God, for making us a successful seed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.